This is what we call humbili humbility. 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 Uh, to be with uh, with us like clergy in the morning, and Taban, we seize the opportunity uh, so that you are here and we let go of you. So we said, Yani, eh, yani, we're gonna make it, Yani, uh, <laughs> morning and evening and uh, noon time, <laughs> and of course, continuing in the clerical uh, course, clerical seminary. So, uh, so he will be giving a course in the clerical seminary over this coming week and Friday evening and Saturday uh, whole day. Uh, I forgot the title. Can you remind me with the title? Uh, and I have to remember. Uh, Salvation, Judgment in the Afterlife. Salvation, Judgment after this is the This is the seminary as well? Uh, no, the seminary the is seminary. just topics in eschatology. The topics yeah. about the eschatology. Do you know what is eschatology? The who? The eschatology, the eschatology. Maybe I will, I will. Uh, maybe maybe you something. can give us uh, <laughs> just a definition. If, a study of something. A study of see, that. In, in theology, in theology, we like to give a fancy word yes. to something that is not. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> it makes it more important. <laughs> uh, it makes us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Good, good terminology. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's the second coming, right? So it's, uh, uh, yeah, the, the end times. The end times. It's it's about the the, the end of uh, the end times. So uh, if anyone would like to, would like you can register and take the course. It's a course. It's a credited course in the seminary in the Coptic uh, 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 clerical seminary. We know we have a seminary, so uh, it would be a good idea if you really register and take this course. So usually every I think every month there is a course in the seminary. So it would be a great opportunity. It's part of the learning kind of. Uh, more academic learning, more kind of focused uh, knowledge with resources. Uh, of course, there are some homework, but you can audit it so you don't do the homework. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have, we have many, ma many options, but I think this is the graduate level that it would be very uh, good opportunity for all of us. So please join me in, in, in welcoming uh, Deacon Brother Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you all. Um, <clears throat> well, basically, <laughs> we just want to talk about the end times. Eschatology, all it is, the word is, it comes from the Greek word eschaton. The eschaton are the end things. But to make it sound fancy, talking about the end times, we have to call it eschatology. and <laughs> Christology, we're talking about the nature of Christ. and uh, Soteriology from Suteria, which is uh, salvation. Like what we say when we say, uh, he's become a, my salvation. So, uh, these are just, yani, they like to take the Greek word and make it sound big, yani, sound fancy. <clears throat> when we speak about the end times, um, there are typically three things that go together. The second coming of Christ, the resurrection, the general resurrection when everybody rises from the dead, and the judgment. Those three things. Right? Again, the second coming of Christ, the general resurrection of the dead when everyone rises from the dead, and the judgment. Those three things go together and they are fundamental principles and teachings of Christianity. You know, if I don't believe in them, I am not Christian. That's how basic they are. You know? Like the Trinity, like our belief in the nature of Christ, like the Eucharist, like all of these things. If we don't believe in these things, then we're not Christian. That's how basic it is. And in fact, when people came to be baptized, one of the things they had to say from the very early church is you have to believe in the resurrection of the flesh. You have to believe in the resurrection, in the last day. 
in not just the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection and uh, everyone is going to rise from the dead. That's how basic it was. All right? For these things are very important for us to understand and to believe. And we might take it very simply today, but these things weren't easy for people to understand, and especially uh, in the early years, in the, uh, in, the, in the culture that they were living in. In the, مثلاً, <clears throat> in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, the time of the apostles. Do you remember the story when St. Paul was in Athens and he saw, he was waiting for the others who were with him to come and he saw all the different statues and idols and, to, and he couldn't keep quiet and he had to say something. This is in Acts chapter 17. All right. So what happened was, was that he started to speak. He said, I see you, you're a very religious people, and I see here you have uh, a monument to the unknown God. And he started here and he started talking. Well, they heard everything he had to say, all the way up until he spoke about the, the resurrection of the flesh. And then they thought he was, eh, something wasn't right. He wasn't normal. Because to them, the resurrection of the, of the flesh was absurd. It was a very strange idea. Why? Because in Greek theology, in Greek philosophy, the body was prisoned. It was the, the body was a prison for the soul. So why on earth, if the soul was imprisoned in the body, that the body would rise again? The haga, crazy, I mean. Doesn't make any sense. Because for us Christians, it's absolutely necessary. Okay? And we can talk more about this in a moment. But these three things, they go together. And as I said, unless we believe in them, we're not Christians at all. I want to read a quote for you from um, an early church father. His name is St. Polycarpus. Do you guys, have you heard that name before? Polycarpus? Yeah? Who is, who is Polycarpus? You're going like this. So I assume you... You know who St. Polycarpus is. Or you just heard the name? No. Okay, okay, you just heard the name. Okay. Okay. Tarafu. Tarafu. This one. Who is. Good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, holy man. I heard he was a good guy. Yeah. Who is who St. Is, who is Polycarp? Who is Polycarpus? Hmm? He was the Bishop of Smyrna. You heard about Smyrna? It's actually modern day Smyr in Turkey. This, you know, Smyrna was an uh, ancient city in the area Asia Minor, and he was the bishop over it. He was a disciple of St. John the Evangelist. So there's a title we give to them. There's our fathers, the apostles, and their disciples, we call them apostolic fathers. Okay, we have a name for them. So St. Polycarp, he was one of the apostolic fathers. They're a very important link between and it's about our Lord Jesus Christ and our fathers, the apostles, and then their disciples. So St. Paul, St. Polycarp was one of them. So he has, uh, we have very few writings for him. And one of the writings we have is something called the Epistle to the Philippians, to the people of Philippi. And he says the following to them. He says, for whosoever does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is Antichrist. And here he's, he's referring to 1 John 4.3. And whosoever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil. And whosoever perverts the oracles of the Lord to his own lusts and says that there is neither a resurrection nor a judgment, he is the firstborn of Satan. And if we use this language today, somebody's going to beat us up. Yani. And if we use it in the bus or in school or at work, whatever, yani, it's not. Here he's saying if somebody doesn't believe in the resurrection, and the judgment, he is eh, the firstborn of Satan. Then why does he use such strong language? Other than that's what the language they used back then. But why do you think he's so bad? Uh, and he's so yeah, he's strict about it. If, I, if you don't believe in the resurrection or the judgment, or whoever says there is no resurrection or judgment, he's the firstborn of Satan. Kharina fit judgment dirwati. If I say there is no judgment, why is that so dangerous? You're free to do whatever you want. You're not accountable. 
basically, yeah. Live your life, yeah? You guys, I don't know if you say the same expressions here or not. You guys have a YOLO, or karam da kodo. You only live once, or all these things, right? Yeah? So you have people walking around with hats that have karam da kodo. Yeah? Okay. Taban, that's ridiculous. When it says you only live once, مش عشان واحد يتوب ويعيش مع ربنا. No, you only live once. يعني إيه free. يعني without boundaries. خالص in anything. كل واحد يمشي في الخطية من without any any sort of accountability for whatever whatever you're gonna do. And they say you're being free. They're living their life. No, you're not. You're the, you're digging a hole for yourself. فهنا the judgment here is absolutely necessary. Not just because not just to keep me accountable. But for the sake of receiving the reward that God wants to give to those who love Him, yeah, and those who follow in His way, for the judgment is absolutely necessary. The judgment is absolutely necessary. That why the resurrection? Why is it so necessary, Anna? That we rise from the flesh in the last day. Maybe we'll take just one of these points and then. And go into depth on it, yeah. It would have value to live a good, like to live on Earth because you know that there's something coming after. It's not just like you live once and that's it. It doesn't end there. Right. So you have this. We can do that in the soul. We can do that. Taban. We know that when we depart, the body is buried, but the soul is, is immortal. The soul lives forever. That we could do that in heaven forever in our soul and with our with our soul. Why is the resurrection of the flesh so important? To the extent that we say it in the creed, you know, we say we look for it. We look for the resurrection of the dead. We look for it. We look for the resurrection of the dead in the light of the coming age. And even in baptism. And to who who remembers attending baptisms besides your own, Yani Taban? If you remember it. If you remember it, but who's who's attended a baptism? Okay, you know, Taban, there's a part in the baptism where uh, typically the parents, Basiani, whoever is taking the faith on behalf of the infant, right? The or the God, whoever, Basiani, they, they turn to the West, right? And they raise their hand and they say, I renounce you, Satan, with all your impure works and all your, right? I renounce you, I renounce you, I renounce you, I renounce you right? And then one of them says, come out, you unclean spirit. And then eh, they turn to the east and they say, eh, I accept you, O Christ, my God. Yeah? And we could go into more detail about this. But then they say a small creed. Yeah? They speak of believing in the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the... In a, uh, Yani, this kind of salvation, yani, and then in the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church and the resurrection of the flesh. Yani, in those few things, in order to be baptized as a Christian, you have to proclaim your faith in eh, the resurrection and the last day, the resurrection of the flesh. That why is it so important? That it's so important that St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then eh, then your faith is in vain. Then Christ isn't risen from the dead, and your faith is eh, in vain. It's futile. <laughs> and you're, you're wasting your time. Forget it. That's how important it is. Why? Okay, one of the reasons, because the same body that labored to strive with Christ, there needs to be a reward and a kind of a bodily reward as well. Right, so it's for the sake of the judgment. Ana Dilwati, when I do anything, is my do do is it my soul only that does it, good or bad? Is it only my soul does it or my body also does it with it? It participates. Both. Both. You know, I'm not just soul. You know, some people when we behave, we think we're just flesh and bones or we're a so let ihna we're body and soul together, Mishkada. For <laughs> whatever we do, whether good or bad, whether good or bad, has to be is 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 in is body and soul together as one person. Yeah? So for God to be a just judge in the last day, we are judged as 
in the, in the form, in the way that we, we did everything. Because we're going to be judged according to our works. Yes? Yes? No? Yes? Yes? Okay. Good. So we're going to be judged according to our works. If, uh, for God to be a just judge, He's going to judge us in the way, in the form that we did anything, which is, has to be a body and soul together. So I inherit the eternal life in the way that God a, uh, created, yani, body and soul together, judged in that way. There are two other reasons. There's three reasons. There are three basic reasons. Why is the resurrection so important? The resurrection of Christ was also in the, was, was bodily, not just spirit. Like it was the resurrection of Christ was, uh, as a model for the resurrection, was a bodily resurrection. He told the disciples, come see and, 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 and touch me. It was more for the, but the resurrection of Christ was the promise and the assurance of the eternal life for us. But the question more is, why is our resurrection and last day so important? There's two other reasons. Well, into, you, you came from work and you don't want to think right now. You just want somebody to speak with you and get the meeting over. No, no, I'm not that easy. I was going to say what Awuna said pretty much. It's like because Christ resurrected, so we have to resurrect in the flesh too. But the interesting thing is that that's not how St. Paul says it. And if I go, maybe I should. Is there a Wi-Fi? Or, uh, or, uh, yeah. Just uh, so we can. OK, so 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, starting from verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So coming to the point that was, is being said now, St. Paul, he doesn't say if Christ isn't risen, there's no resurrection. No, he says it the other way around. If there's no resurrection, then eh, Christ isn't risen from the dead. There's something called the doctrine of eh, the resurrection of the dead. So Christ, he's the first fruits. He is the proof and the assurance and the hope and uh, the image of, the resur of what's going to happen to us in the last day. Mm -hmm. The doctrine of the resurrection of the flesh. You see? And the Jews actually had this idea. We're just going to talk about the resurrection today, which is good. So <clears throat> the resurrection of the flesh was believed it was it was a doctrine even before Christ. It's from the Old Testament. And there's assurance of this you know, in, in the Old Testament as well as stories in the New Testament. You know, there's indication that there was belief in the resurrection of the flesh in the last day, even before Christ rose from the dead. How do we know this? There's some very well known stories that you I'm sure you know, but we don't think about it this way. And I'll come back to my other question in a, in a moment. What are some stories in the Bible that assure us that the Jews actually had a belief in the resurrection even before Christ rose from the dead? Or before they, or, or they believed that Christ rose from the dead? Do we have a hint? Huh? Do we have a hint? A hint? So is it, are you looking for something from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Either. Well, the Old, the Old Testament has prophecies. Okay, so the New Testament? And the New Testament has some stories, some verses, yes. So they tried to, the, 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 the apostles were scared, they were hiding because the Jews were passing the news that the disciples like hid the body so they can kind of get rid of the idea that Jesus resurrected. So they were scared in the upper room, right? When Jesus appeared to them, peace be with you and all that stuff, because they were scared from what the Jews had said. Then. But that isn't necessarily a proof that they believed in the resurrection. That's actually, they're trying to deny that Christ rose from the dead. Yeah. No. <laughs> How about no. Elijah when 
he resurrect the child? Uh, no, I mean, they believe in the power of God, of course, but it's not specifically the resurrection of the flesh. Okay. There's stories in the New Testament, but we don't think about them this way. We know the story, and they're actually very popular stories, but we don't think about them as proofs that the Jews actually believed in something called the resurrection of the flesh. Well, it's Lazarus. <laughs> what part of the story of Lazarus? That he died and he stayed in the tomb for four days. No. There's another part of the story that proves they believed in the resurrection. Do you get, but when I say the belief in the resurrection of the flesh, I'm talking about what's going to happen in the last day, that everyone is going to rise from the dead. I think when Mary said to Jesus, uh, when he said, I am the resurrection, and he said, I know that he will rise in the last right. day. Right, so what happened with Martha? Remember Christ, when he heard about Lazarus, he what did he do? He stayed where he was two more days, right? Mm -hmm. And then, after, and then afterwards he went, yes? So when he went and Martha heard that he was coming, she went out to meet him, said, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Christ told her that he is going to rise again. Faheya, Martha, what did she say to him? What was her answer? He I said, know. yes, Lord, I know that he is going to rise eh, again. And again in eh, the last day. And before Christ rose from the dead, before he died and rose from the dead, already some idea in the resurrection of the flesh in the last day. Did it click what it is? You got it? There's this and other, other stories. Is there even contention between the Sadducees and the Pharisees about, yeah. about the resurrection? When, when St. Paul was talking and he mentioned resurrection, this is when the crowd started to fight. <laughs> Right, so, some of them believed in it and some did not believe in the resurrection. So, so in the book of Acts, remember St. Paul, he was on trial, right? He was before, before the Sanhedrin. And uh, remember the, the high priest, he hit St. Paul. And he told him, and he rebuked him. For somebody told him, you speak to the high priest that way? He said, sorry, I didn't know he was the high priest. And then it says he perceived that there were some who were Pharisees and some who were Sadducees. And he, he know how to make a, an issue because they had issues amongst themselves. So he told them, he said, I'm being judged out of hope of the resurrection of the, flat, of the dead. So the Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection of, of the dead. For whom, as they said, we, we don't find any problem in him. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in it. There's another story that shows they didn't believe in it. Do you remember when Christ... Um, after he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, a couple of days later, there were groups of them and they went to Christ and they tried to make him fall into something he would say. So the Pharisees came to him, or sorry, the, uh, the Pharisees, they came to him and they told him, uh, you know, are we, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Christ told them, he said, give me a, why are you, why are you, into, why are you I mean, Meshachar, give me a coin. So he said, whose inscription is this on the coin? Caesar's. Caesar's. So he said, give what, what Caesar's to Caesar and give to God, which is God's. Right? And then the Sadducees came and the Sadducees put together this story for him. He said, look, they said, there is a woman who is married and her husband died before she had any children. So according to the law, and this is something called the Leveret Law, the, the law in the Old Testament. If a, woman, if, a, if a man dies without children, his brother is bound to take his wife in order to have children in his name. Okay? So his brother took her. He died without children. The same, the third, the fourth, all the way to the seventh, and then finally she died. Yeah, but in the resurrection, it was kind of... They were trying to create a problem for Christ and make him fall into something. Why? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So they told them in the resurrection, who's, who's husband, right? Yani who's, which one is her husband? Yani? He said, you know neither the power of God nor the scriptures. Because in the resurrection, they are neither married nor given in marriage, but are like a... Like angels in heaven. 
Yeah, here, there is something that the Jews had some concept of, whether they believed in it or not, that was something called the resurrection of the flesh. Make sense? And there's many other verses and there's prophecies in the Old Testament speaking about there's in, in Job chapter 19, we'll hear, okay? Isaiah chapter 25 uh, and, and, and other verses that speak about the resurrection of the flesh. It's something that we look forward to. All right, and the story of the Maccabees. There's some a beautiful story. Do you guys know about the Maccabees? No, not too well. I've heard of the book, but I haven't read it. Okay, so there's first and second Maccabees. Who knows who can who knows the basic idea of what happened with the Maccabees? Hmm. Yes. It was a family, and they were sort of going into war with I don't remember who exactly it was, but they had to fight. And they should have been having low odds every time, but sometimes they won and sometimes they lost and they were able to keep them in they were in. Right. So it was at the time after Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, he had a huge kingdom, right? He had conquered all the way from Sharif, India all the way to you know, their lands, you know, all the way east and west. And then when Alexander the Great died, he, um, he divided his kingdom amongst his, his generals or Diodoka and you know, his successors. So what happened was, was there was in that region, the Ptolemies are the ones who had Egypt. Right? The Ptolemies had Egypt in that region. And then northwards in the area of like Syria and this area was something called the Seleucids. And one of the kings at that time, his name was Antiochus. Antiochus IV. Anti and Antiochus there, he was... You know, um, he, did, he, he was you know, really bad to the Jews. He defiled the temple and he... A lot of the Jews, they left that area at that time. Muhim. And actually, a lot of them fled to Egypt, which is one of the reasons Egypt, from very early times, was full of, you know, full of Jews, you know, both in Alexandria and in the south. You know. so what happened was, and in fact, he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. You know when we say the, the Feast of Epiphany? It's a divine manifestation. Faho, he was called Antiochus Epiphanes, and how he was... You know, divine or very you know, exalted. But because of what the Jews, what he did to the Jews, they called him Epimenus instead of Epiphanus. You know what Epimenus is? You know when somebody's manic? It was, he's, you know, he's, you know, basically, they called him crazy. You know. And he did a lot of you know, bizarre things. And Muhammad, Fahid devoured the temple, he did a lot of things. So in order to take the temple back and to fight again, and he tried to, he tried to get the Jews to follow Greek culture. And a lot of things that were in uh, Greek culture that many times were against the law that the Jews had that God gave to Moses. And he tried to force it upon them. Uh, things to eat and um, uh, certain, and many, many, many other things. Muhim. So what happened was, is that the Maccabees, this family, okay, um, named after Judas Maccabeus. Judas was one, the son of the one who started the movement, Yani. And so the Maccabees, they fought against um, the Seleucids uh, uh, for a long period of time in order to regain the temple and to purify the temple and to bring back, yani, to fight against what they were trying to do to them to, to take away the, the, their life and the law and their living according to God's commandments. But, and the, there are two books of Maccabees that we accept as part of scripture. Okay. In the second book of Maccabees, there's a wonderful story, and actually they're in, their, in our synaxarium. We have a feast day for them. Um, a woman, by, the, her, by tradition, her name is Saloma, and her seven sons. And what they did is they tried to get each of the sons to forsake the law that God gave to them, the Jewish law, and to, all, about all this is before Christ, and to... Um, abide by what the king had told them to do. But when they didn't, they killed each of them in succession, from the oldest to the youngest, in front of their mother. And finally, they, they killed her too. The sum of the story is that each one of them, when they were being killed, they accepted being killed and being tortured because they believed in the resurrection of the flesh. And they do whatever you're going to do to us, but it's going to mean nothing because in the end we're going to be raised 
in the resurrection whole, yeah. Okay? You know, the whole story was <laughs> to get to that point, yeah. For, for, there's many stories, both in, the, in prophecies in the Old Testament and stories in the New Testament that show the belief in the resurrection of the flesh, even before Christ rose from the dead. So I'm going to go back to my original question. Why is the doctrine of the resurrection of the flesh so important? The first thing we said was because of the judgment. Because whatever I do in this life, whether good or bad, I do body and soul together, right? For I'm not just, my soul isn't judged alone. Yeah, but I have to be judged as a human being as a whole. Yes, the way that I did the works for God to be a just judge and for me to receive that judgment in the way that I did those things. All right? What are the other reasons? There's two other reasons that the doctrine of the resurrection is so important. The Haga Asasiyya, like it was some people that you didn't hear in the beginning. This is a fundamental teaching of Christianity. If you do not believe in the resurrection of the flesh, you are not a Christian. Hmm. I'll, I'll hint to one of them. What was the condemnation on Adam? And Eve, when they ate from the tree, they had to leave paradise and be separated from God. Before they had to leave paradise, Death. what did God tell them? You surely will die. Right. So He said, "Of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And the day you eat of it, you'll eat, you'll eat, surely die." And the way it's written in Arabic is very close to the Hebrew, because they're Semitic languages. Yeah, it's very the same. Maut and temut. Right? It's imperative. Yani, the way it's written in English, you can't say, in dying you will die. No. Yani, it, you, yani, you will die. And the death that Adam died, he didn't just die one death, he died three deaths. He died a physical death, he died a moral death, and he died a spiritual death. So the physical death, taban, obvious. Yeah? Yani, in fact, a couple chapters later, it says, he says, and Adam lived to be a, more than 900. It was like 903 years, okay? And, and Adam lived to be 903 years, and he, he died physically. In 1 Corinthians 15, what does St. Paul say? He says, the last enemy to be destroyed is a yeah. death. Yani, God intended for Adam to live a forever. Yes? He gave him a gift of immortality. So the idea here is that there is to be no more death. So for there to be no more death, there has to be a, a resurrection of the flesh. But us? This is the second point. The third point is a, what's the third reason? It's related, yeah. For us to live with God forever in the way he created us. Did that God just create us as souls? No, well, he created us as human beings, with body and soul together, right? So if God created us that way, he wants us to be with him forever in the way he created us. Body and soul together. So for us to live with God for eternity, we live with him in the way that he intended for us to be, the way he created us in the beginning which is body and soul together. But this is the first reason. The second reason, the last enemy to be destroyed is a death. There will be no more death. And the third reason, because of the judgment. You know, I will be judged in the way that uh, I did things, whether it good or bad. Yes. Yes. If you don't believe in resurrection, some people are not born as Christians, as us, we were inherited by the grace of God. But if someone, let's say, atheist or agnostic or in a different faith altogether, so does that mean they're not going to enter heaven if they're not believers of that, I may, that, I'll, Let me specify, let me say exactly what I said. Sorry, I, I said 
that if you don't believe in the resurrection, you are not a Christian. Okay? Meaning, if I say that I'm a Christian, along with being Christian comes a certain faith. And that's why we have the creed. Yes? And we say it all the time. We say it in, in the prayers in the Agbeya, we say it in the liturgy, we say it out of EY. Because when I take communion, I take it based on that faith. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for me to proceed forward. At baptism, we say the creed. When we say the Agbeya prayers, we say the creed. In any service, in any sacrament, we say the creed. Yes? When we ha when in the liturgy, the Eucharist, we say the creed. Why? Because in order to partake of that mystery or to part or to, you know, to, to have the correct Christian faith, yes, or to, 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 to part, participate in that mystery, I have to have the right faith. When people come to baptism, they say a creed, they say a faith. And we mentioned earlier, maybe it was before you came in, when someone is baptized, there's a small creed that you say, yeah? Yani Abuna says, and, and if the person is old enough to say it themselves, they say it themselves. If they're infants, the parents or whoever takes the faith in their behalf has to say it. And one of the things that is said is that you have to believe in the resurrection of the flesh. And in fact, in the early church, one of the forms of baptism that was done was the priest would ask a question. So the first question is, do you believe in God Almighty, God the Father, who created heaven and earth? And you say, yes, I believe. And then he would eat the first immersion. The second, do you believe in the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf, right? And rose from the dead, right? And is coming again. Yes, I believe. The second immersion. And the third one involves believing in the church, the Holy Spirit in the church and eh, the resurrection of the flesh. Eh, this is the third immersion. What does this mean? Unless you say that you believe in it, you can't be eh, baptized. That's how fundamental it is. But that's what I'm saying. For you to say that you are Christian, for someone to say they are Christian, yeah, but I have to have <coughs> this faith, this understanding. Does that make sense? With that? Yeah. This is another, another big issue. Okay. I think the follow up question would be, if someone's why do we keep on affirming it? Like, it's almost like reaffirming of the faith. Just like the Catholic Church, they have the version of the creed, right? And more about the community in the Catholic Church, they miss some parts. But some you know, or other denominations, they might not have it at all. So some people are arguing, why are we repeating it? Or, like, what's the benefit, in other words? Why are we saying this? I know for us as Christian Orthodox, by the grace of God, we don't why are we repeating this? Okay, so I'll, I'll address the issue of repetition, why we keep saying it. Why do we keep saying the creed? There are two things. First of all, it's not just good enough to believe in something, I have to express it. I have to, I have to say what I believe, okay? For me, you notice in the liturgy, there's a lot of times where one does something and then we say, eh, I believe, or amin, or some form of this. Meaning what? We have to keep saying that we believe, and actually before we approach the communion, Right before communion, Abuna says, eh, Holy body and precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amin. And we all say, eh, Amin. And he says, Holy bo right? body and uh, precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he, sa and we, he says, Amen. And we all say, eh, Amen. And then he says, Bisum, the body and blood of Emmanuel, our Lord. This is so in truth, Amen, Amen. And then one says, Amen, 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 I believe, I believe, I believe and confess. It. Why? Because the faith that we have, we have to express it. We have to say it out loud. And this is beneficial for a couple different reasons. Number one, for me to proclaim my faith, number one. But number two, because many times, a lot of times we don't, ha we don't have uh, the proper knowledge or understanding of our faith. So it has to be said out loud, especially in, in Yanni, the, the great majority of us, Yani, I, will, I will make the assumption that the great majority of people, if not everybody here, was baptized when they were infants, correct? Yes. Okay. So obviously when we were infants, we didn't know the faith that we, that we were baptized under. So the constant repetition 
of that faith is for us to grow up and to hear that faith constantly so that we learn it. Yeah? And maybe initially we don't understand everything in it. Maybe we just learned, and I mess you know, we're growing up in Sunday school, Meshi, I learned the Ben al I learned Nazim uh, Akimunno, right? We, I learned um, uh, the Creed. I learned these other prayers or these other, why? And maybe it's just memorization in the beginning, just to say that eh, I, I know this, or I heard this, or I know it, or I memorized it. But then later on, after I know the words very well, then comes with it a eh, understanding. But at least I, eh, I have the principles, I have the idea, I have the, the, the what, what I am supposed to believe in. Yeah. For, for this, is, this is one part. The other part is, is even if I know something, it's good to be reminded. And we need to be reminded constantly. And he mentioned when Abuna sometimes when he says a sermon, is everything that Abuna says all the time, Yani, new information for us? Sometimes it's a lot of times it's repetitive, right? Right? And let's be honest, Yani, when we come to a certain time of year, what Abuna says then is maybe a lot of the same things that he said. Eh, before, the year before, why? Because there's certain points that are very important for him and he wants to keep, yani, he likes to remind people of them. Yes? Not because of one as being, yani, just for the sake of being mundane or, or repetitive. No, it's because they're important points, yes? And we need to be reminded, this is the reality. Shkada? And it's, and it's not just in terms of the faith and prayers. It's in terms of... Uh, any certain principle, even work, right? I mean, when you, when you advance in a job or a certain profession, right? Isn't there sometimes where I have to go back and you, I forgot, Mashad, at this point I have to go look up in this reference, I have to... Yeah. And a lot of times you have to go back to the basics because you went, became very specialized, right? And then you said that I have to go back and see. I remember, Mashad, I learned in the course I took, Mashad, and, and you have to go back and be reminded of, of the things that you learned. For this is for these are the two things to make sure I know my faith very well, and number two to be a, to be reminded because we need to be reminded. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and also, like the, one of the reasons for the creed is to counteract wrong teachings and heresies that were of that time, and I think it's continuing. Uh, that 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 every now a lot of uh, theological ideas might come up against us, and sometimes we need to be reminded. What is our belief? So to be to to answer many questions, just going to the creed would be able to offset a lot of the wrong teachings that are prevalent, that were prevalent that time and are still prevalent in our in our own time. Because Harry, like the devil, is very active, and by little changes of things and bringing up a lot of new ideas. So going back to the basics is also reminding me with what is my belief. What do I believe in living in the Trinity, living in the church, living in the resurrection, living in this and living in this. This is basically summarizing my summarizing my faith as well, a kind of reinforcing uh, what I believe in against <coughs> any wrong teachings or heresies. Yes, that's a very important, thank you, Abuna. It's a very, very important point. And I'm gonna add to this, not just knowing the, the, the creed itself, but the proper interpretation and understanding of the creed. And I'll give you an example. Um, two. Yeah, I mean, the scriptures. Christians, since we're talking about different denominations and, and Christians, right? We all use the same book, right? Yes. The, how many denominations of Christianity are there? Uh, two or three. I think. If some of them, Yanni. Yeah, uh, there's the Oriental Church, which we are part of, which is a non-Chalcedonian, uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox, and then Catholics, and then Protestants. Okay, so what what number, Yami? Yeah, mean. Thousands. <laughs> there are thousands, thousands of denominations that call themselves Christian, and we all use uh, the same book. How did this happen? Different translations. That before the different translations. Yes. Interpretations. It, interpretation, right? Not just of the scriptures, but how we receive the faith. Yes? 
Martin Luther. Martin Luther King, the one. Right. And English. So he took a verse from the Bible, interpreted it. On a personal level, right. and he goes out of the post. Exactly. And, and I heard something to simplify it. I heard the, uh, a, a, a way of thinking about it. There's two ways to read the scriptures. Either I'm thinking about a different I'm thinking about a different way. I can either submit the scriptures to my mind or submit my mind to the scriptures. Yeah? Think about it. Either I submit my mind to the scriptures as an authority over me, and this is what Abuna does. Abuna Ushit al Ingir, right? When we say the prayer of the gospel and the liturgy, he says the prayer and then he goes around the altar with the deacon, right? And it, and he's holding a Bashaya, right? The the Bashara, right? The shirt, the shirt. The gospels. He's holding it in his hands. And then Abuna takes them and what does he do with it? After he goes around, he, he does something with them. He goes like this. Like what? He puts it over his head. He puts it on top of his head. And this is a sign of a submission. It's above us. Yes? Make sense? And it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah? So this is, we submit to the scriptures. If I submit the scriptures to my own mind, yiba'i, there's no, there's no end. And what Protestants say, sola scriptura, this is, this is a fallacy. It doesn't exist. Once I've taken away the authority and the teaching of the tradition of the church, right? there's no such thing as sola scriptura or scripture alone. Basically what you're saying is you want to interpret it the way you want to interpret it. That's, what it, that's the end of it. So, so, and I, there's a, a story that my priest, Abu Nashnuda, uh, told me. Um, Abu Nashnuda, he's a scholar and a theologian. And a, PhD. Uh, well, uh, yeah, amongst other things. Yeah. So Abu uh, before he was a priest, uh, when he was Dr. Amin Meher, when he was doing his defil in Oxford years back in the 70s, uh, he heard about somebody who was giving a talk in theology. So, and this, it was the first time, yani, he was out in England, out, out of Egypt, yani, and he said, Mesh, yani, we'll hear And this is in the 70s, and there were all sorts of strange things being said. Wow. There was an Episcopal bishop from Jersey. He was well known at the time. He was well known, not in a good way. <laughs> he was incredibly liberal. His, guy, his name was Spong. For, and he had written books and was giving to Yanni. He was in this lecture, um, and he's a bishop. He was doubting the resurrection. He was doubting the incarnation, the virgin birth. He was doubting Yanni, the ascension of Christ. And he doubting the basic fundamentals of, of what we believe as Christians. Yanni. For Abu Nimkanjim said that, you know, one Especially coming straight out of Yanni. Egypt and our culture to, to, to hearing these things in England. And he was, he was floored. Yeah. For his, professor, his mentor was an Anglican priest, and he was much more conservative, and he told him, he goes, let me explain to you. He's trying to get him to understand the culture. He said, we have the Bible, you have the Bible. We have liturgy, you have liturgy. We have tradition, you have tradition. We have the fathers, you have the fathers. The difference is, is that you take all of these things and you put them as a, an authority over you. As for us, we take all of these things and we submit them under our own minds. And since everybody has a different mind, anything goes. He explained it to him, and I still remember the story until today that Abuna told me, because it's very expressive, Yanni, of, of the culture and the, of how we are supposed to approach the church and the teaching in it. Okay? But it's not just, going back to the point, it's not just uh, the, 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 the headlines of what we believe in, the interpretation of it. The other, the other uh, story I wanted to tell you about this was going, going back to 
the fifth century, the Nestorian controversy. And you heard about Nestorius? Yes. What was Nestorius' heresy? Something to do with the nature of Christ, I think, to do with, with uh, was it to do with uh, not having divine, divinity, something related to the divinity of Christ? Well, it's relating to the nature of Christ, but it was a little different. The one who denied the divinity of Christ was Arius. Oh, Arius. Yeah. There's a time when the son was not, that he was created. What was Nestorius' heresy? Something to do with the virgin birth, but she did Yes and no, but that wasn't the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is that he didn't believe that Christ was one. He divided the divinity and humanity in Christ. Okay? He said there was the Logos, and then there was the man, Jesus Christ, and they were somehow yani, associated. Yani, the, one that, the one that the Virgin Mary gave birth to is the man, Jesus Christ, and God, the Logos, was yani, associated with him. For, there were, the reason I'm bringing up this point is that in this controversy, there was letters going back between St. Cyril of Alexandria, who was our Pope, and Nestorius. And they're very important and famous letters. And the two of them called the second and the third letter to Nestorius. In those letters, um, he, in the third letter in particular, he puts uh, the exact words of what the Nicene Creed are. And he's he and, and one of the things he's telling Nestorius is is yeah, they had the same creed. You know, we said the same creed. But he's telling him that Nestorius' interpretation of the creed is wrong. Yani we say the same words, but the way that Nestorius is, his understanding of it is, is incorrect and not in accordance with the tradition we received. So it's not just the words that we say, it's the understanding and the faith that comes along with it. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right. Um, no, <laughs> and we were talking about the resurrection, and we started with eschatology. We went in a good trajectory. Uh, um, as long as we're on the topic of the resurrection, okay. So, what if I told you there were two resurrections? We don't believe that. We believe in one resurrection. Are you sure? Yes. Positively sure? Yes. Okay. Who agrees? Anna Ba'ud, I say there's two resurrections, and he says there's only one. That's said that would mean Not to put you on the spot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's our smart guy here. Uh, taban, of course, yeah. Huh? Maybe I'm thinking of Christ, because there's one resurrection of Christ. I think I'm, I, what I'm talking about is a little different than I think what you're thinking about. Okay. We, we can both be right in this, yani, in this situation. It yeah. depends It depends on the interpretation. It depends, uh, depends uh, on the wording. Uh, yeah, the wording. That's right. Yes. But if you're looking at the resurrection of the dead, so prior to Jesus' resurrection, like when Adam died and everything was buried, right, he was cursed. But when Jesus comes again, that's when the apocalypse sees, that when Jesus went to Hades, and so what you're talking about is the general resurrection in the last day, when everybody rises from the dead. Okay. okay. So what, that's, that's, the, that's the second one, right? That's the second one. That's the second one. What's the first one? It's when the resurrected and the baptism. So baptism? Somebody said baptism? That's it, Yana? The resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead, and I believe that there are two resurrections. So one is the resurrection of the dead, and then the one that we are going to resurrect. Coming here, John. Okay, let's, we have to, okay. So who's, let's take it step by step here. Who says, raise your hand. Okay. Who says there's only one resurrection? Only one? Okay. And who says there are two? And to get the machine, get the Okay, or, yeah, whatever. Uh, you say two, Meshi, two. Okay. Then why do you why do you why do you say there's only one? 
because the resurrection that I know about is the the, um, the change of the status of the body from dead to live. And we die only once when we die, like the last day when we take the last breath, and we'll be resurrected again for the judgment, which I want to ask about again when we finish the mm-hmm. So this is the only death I can die, and then there will be only one resurrection. Okay, so you're talking about the resurrection of the flesh in the last day, so? Yeah. Okay. Okay, if someone would be so kind to read from verse 24 and then up until verse 29. This is John chapter 5. John chapter 5, from verse 24. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? From verse 24 to 29. Who's going to, who can read? You can all read, obviously, but who would like to read now? I can read. You read? Okay. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the the resurrection of condemnation. Thank you. So Christ here, he's speaking about the resurrection. Because how many is he speaking about here? Two. Two. Okay, let's go back to verse 24, 25. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and eh, now is. And when you're speaking about the resurrection of the flesh, that's going to happen in the last day, at the second coming of Christ. But here he says there's another resurrection that's going to happen now. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. There's a distinction here. What's going to happen in the last day, who is it going to happen to? Everyone. 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 Every human being that ever lived is going to rise from the dead. And then there is a resurrection to life, and there is a resurrection to a condemnation. Okay? The resurrection is again associated with a the judgment. All right. That's the resurrection of the flesh, especially since in verse 29 he says a, or 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all who are, in the, who are in the graves will hear his voice. And here he's speaking specifically about the resurrection of the flesh. Clear? Okay. In verse 25, it's not going to happen in the last day. It's happening eh? no. now. Is it for everyone? No. Uh, and now is when the dead will hear the voice. But the dead here are who? Speaking about who? What is death here that he is speaking about? So that not a physical death. He's speaking about a spiritual death. And those who are, uh, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. Yani, is it going to happen to everybody? No, it's not going to. It's only for those who eh, hear. For those who hear. And it's happening eh, no. now. Okay, so there's the first resurrection. If this is the first resurrection, if, uh, What's involved in it? Taban, the second resurrection in the last day. Taban, we know this is the resurrection of the flesh. The, if that's a resurrection of the flesh, then what's this resurrection? What's the resurrection that's happening now? What's involved in it? Confession. Hmm? Confession. Okay, so repentance. Why? Because you die when you sin. And then... So death is sin. And then when I turn from sin, it's a resurrection. life, right? And that's what St. Paul says, is the wage of sin is a death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Okay? So repentance is a resurrection, but there's other things involved. And you mentioned it earlier. 
Baptism, right? Because I, when I die with Christ and I'm eh, arisen with him. And St. Paul, he goes, speaks a lot about it in Romans chapter 6. Yes? But there's another one. There's a third thing that's involved in, the, in order to be, have a part in the first resurrection. Communion. The Eucharist, exactly. The Eucharist. And Christ says it. He doesn't say it with those exact words, but he says it. Here, let's go to, uh, this is Rome, this is, sorry, John chapter 5. Go to John chapter 6. What I'm on John chapter 6 is a chapter about, uh, one of the most famous chapters, yes. So is this for the oh, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> I thought you were, I asked, and you raised your hand. <laughs> go ahead. Right? Not bypass judgment. Oh, the idea, when we speak about judgment, we have to give the definition. If you're speaking about judgment as a condemnation, yes. But everybody is going to be judged in the last day. We're all going to stand in front of Christ. Okay. Meaning we'll all go through the process, but not everybody is going to be condemned. Is that clear? Yes. All right. So John chapter 6 is about what? Yes. The bread of life. The Christ, he is the bread of life. Okay? In the end, he gets to the point about the Eucharist. But the whole chapter is about him eh, being the bread of life. All right? So, in this chapter, he relates the idea of him being the bread of life to the resurrection four times. He says, and I will raise him up at the last day. He says it very explicitly about partaking of his body and blood in the very end. But there are three other times when you have to have the belief in Christ, him, and he, again, associated with him being the bread of life, in order to have a, be risen at the last day. Again, when he says being risen at the last day, he's talking about the resurrection to eternal life. Everybody's going to rise. But here he's speaking about having a resurrection to eternal life and not eternal condemnation. So let's read some of these verses. Um, <laughs> Verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should I raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. And this is associated with Him before saying that He was a, the bread of life. Verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will a, raise him up at the last day. Verse 51, he, and he doesn't say this explicitly here, but he says it afterwards. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then afterwards he says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will eat, raise him up at the last day. He associates the belief in him as the bread of life and partaking of his body and blood as an essential component of having the resurrection to a eternal life. I want to make sure this is very clear to people. Because when we partake of communion, of course, there's many, many, many things associated with it. But it's so important for us when we say that everybody is going to rise from the dead in the last day. And there's a resurrection to life, and there's a resurrection to condemnation. Yeah, but for me to have a resurrection to eternal life, I have to partake of his body and blood. Why? Because he is life. So for me to have life in the resurrection in the last day, I have to be united with, a, with him, with the, with the one who rose from the dead, and the one who is life. Abuna, when he says the confession in the end, what does he say? Amen, amen, amen. I believe, I believe, I believe, and confess to the last breath that this is a the life-giving flesh, el gesed al-muhyi, his life-giving. 
So for me to have life, of course, the proper spiritual life and a life away from sin and a life of repentance, all of that goes along with it. But along with it, a resurrection to eternal life in the last day, I have to partake of him who is, a, who is life because he is the one who will give me life. Does that make sense? That's why partaking, that's why taking of his body and blood is so important. You see how everything is connected? Sometimes we talk about stuff together in pieces. And sometimes we don't put the whole the whole the whole picture, the whole story together. But when we take everything and we put it together, we see how important the whole life as a Christian, as an Orthodox Christian, is for the sake of our salvation. Does that make sense? The faith in Christ, being baptized, the resurrection, the last day, the Eucharist, Kulu'da'i. I remember I was told an analogy about our tradition one time. I said it's like a diamond. The diamond, you know how the diamond, when it's cut, it's a lot of different facets? Yeah? The way you turn the diamond, it looks different. But in the end, it's still all, it's all the same diamond. If I messed that in one time, in a talk like tonight, we're talking about the last times and we're talking about the resurrection and the judgment. Another time, somebody's going to talk more in detail about something else, about the Trinity. Another time, somebody's going to talk about the, 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 the nature of Christ. Another time, somebody's going to talk about love or patience or one of the virtues. Another time, somebody's going to talk about the scriptures and so on and so forth, or fasting or prayer. These are all different eh, facets in the diamond. But when you put it all together, it's still eh, it's the one diamond that we received through the church. Is that clear? Does that make sense? And I'm sure of what the time is like of when I went over here. Yeah, so. Before we work in time, so. do we have any questions? Yeah. 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 So I just wanted to know your thoughts. My understanding is that the Coptic Church is for penal substitution, but not how the West necessarily believes in it. Uh, that Christ took our place on the cross. It's it's a whole thing. I I, I don't want to get too much into. Do, do are you aware of the? I'm very aware of it. So, are are you able to just give like a, a two minute thing? Or, the I don't know if I can keep it to two minutes, but <laughs> 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 you started a, you yeah, opened well, it. Yeah, it's because it's been, it's been boggling my mind for the last year. The stuff that the Eastern Church says, I, 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 I kind of disagree with. Some Good. The stuff I've read. You should disagree with it. <laughs> <laughs> Shuf, I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize. Okay. How I, Let me just make a comment about the term. Penal the, the term penal substitution theory, okay, over, over the centuries in Western, Western Christianity, um, even before Protestantism yani, in, in, the, in the Catholic Church, there were some who came up with different ways of trying to explain the incarnation, why Christ came, uh, why he took flesh, these sorts of things. And they tried to explain um, uh, the death on the cross and the resurrection, you know, the, 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 plan, the divine plan of salvation. And there was a certain emphasis by one or two of them uh, on uh, that Christ, he was a substitute for us. And him being, him taking a penalty on our behalf because of the sin, right? The way that they said it, some people thought it was uh, a bit you know, too far extreme or too much emphasis on this um, because it involves a concept of the father or some people interpret it this way. It doesn't mean that's what it was necessarily. That the father poured all of his wrath on the son. 
and that's why he died, okay? This is an interpretation of the concept. It may not necessarily be what the intention was. So when sometimes people speak about penal substitution, they have this concept uh, of almost like, almost, almost to the extent of this idea of the father uh, pouring this wrath upon the son, okay? Of course, when you take it to this extreme, which wasn't the intention, because I know this theory, okay? It wasn't necessarily this theory. Um, sure, it's a bit too far. But to deny that Christ was a substitute and took a penalty for us, to deny this very point is to deny the salvation. Because even when you go back to our fathers, they say that Christ, he was a substitute for us. And they use the word. A subst Saint Athanasius says it on the Incarnation. Okay? That he was a substitute for us. Saint Cyril of Alexandria, he says certain words in Greek, that he was in exchange of us. In our place. He suffered for us. He was, in our, he was dishonored because of this honor that we came under because of the sin. He took our sins upon him in all of Isaiah 53. Yani, yes, and, and St. Cyril actually has a phrase. He said, he paid the penalty for us. St. Cyril, he says it crystal clear. This is his commentary in the Gospel of St. John. So to deny that Christ, he was a substitute for us, is to deny the divine plan of salvation. Some people have a sensitivity towards the term penal substitution, like I said, for the reason that I told you. Um, but when you take the word separately, that he was a penalty and, the, and a, in substitute for us, uh, yani, this, is, this is a teaching of the fathers, it's a teaching of the scriptures, it's a teaching. Yani, um, you know when St. Paul he speaks about Christ as the second Adam, Right? There was the first Adam, yeah, who sinned yeah, and brought death upon himself, sin, death, and corruption. And because we all came from Adam, we're all under sin, death, and corruption. Yes? But to be saved from all of that, instead of coming from the first Adam, we have to become united to uh, the second Adam. So if we're under sin and death and corruption in the first Adam, yeah, but we have to become united to Christ the second Adam, in order to overcome sin and death and corruption. Don't we say when we, all, for all 50 days, we've been saying what him? Christus Anesti, right? We said Christ has risen from the dead. And by death, he eh, trampled death. death. Yeah? So instead of being under death, he gives us a eh, life. life. Instead of being under corruption, he gives us eh, the promise of eh, incorruption. Instead of being under sin, he conquered sin. Why? Because he is the sinless one. Not just he didn't commit any sin. There is no sin in him. He is incapable of sin. And there's a technical term for this. We say he is impeccable. He doesn't know how to sin. There is no sin in him whatsoever. By nature. He is God incarnate and because of the virgin birth. Okay? It, does this help? Clear the situation. Uh, it's just the, 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 I listened to the Greek Orthodox uh, responses, and I just I, I, I couldn't understand what they were talking about. And they say the Father said this. And the look, I'll, didn't need to die on the cross. It's just I, I don't I don't understand. I'll I'll tell you what the issue is. The issue is in the in the fifties, in the fifties, in the sixties. There was somebody uh, who did a, a doctoral dissertation. Um. And he, Greek, he is in a Greek Orthodox. And um, at the time, there was a mentality of like anti-West. Okay, it, and and uh, he was very much anti-Augustine, anti-Western theology. And they called this move at, at the time before him. There was a movement that was called Neopetristic. It was a Neopetristic movement where they said, let's go back to the fathers and we're not gonna be affected by Western theology anymore and we're gonna have our own, which out of if they ended up. So one of the things that got affected, unfortunately, was this teaching of, um, related to uh, what was necessary for our salvation. 
فone of the things he said he said what we received from Adam was death and corruption but we didn't receive sin if we are condemned it's only because of the sins that we commit not because we received sinfulness from Adam and unfortunately he attributed this idea to our fathers and he said Saint Cyril said this وكذا وكذا وكذا. he couldn't be more wrong because Saint Cyril said the exact opposite he made it very clear when we are born we are born sinful Omar then why are we baptized and the fathers are very clear about this and the scriptures are very clear about this when we are born we were born under sin and death and corruption On Monday, why do we say, and we say it in Psalm 50, those who attended the prayers in the beginning, when we say Psalm 50, have mercy upon me, O God, right? In, this, in that Psalm, what do we say? I was brought forth in iniquity and in a, and in sin my mother conceived me. <laughs> I want to show that he says, he says, and when I pray this Psalm, if I don't believe in this, this teaching, then I'm lying. Every time I say this Psalm, Ibn Baghdad. When I say that I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me, that means I must be born <laughs> under sin. Not because I did anything actively, but because I received it from, a, from Adam. Yes? And also, when Abuna he prays, he prays the prayer for the departed. He says a verse that's in the book of Job, but not in the book of Job from maybe the Bibles you're familiar with, in the Greek translation of the Septuagint. In, in chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, he says, uh, No one is pure from blemish, even if his life on earth is a, a single day. In that day, if, if, if I'm sinful and I've only been on earth a day, yeah, but I have to have received it, yes? I didn't have a chance to do anything. And there's many other verses, and this is how the fathers in St. Cyril, and they all interpret it. Yeah, but from the very beginning, I'm under, I'm under sin. So what I receive from Adam is not just death and corruption. Mo death and corruption, dude, these are symptoms. These are consequences, yes? But so death and corruption, where do they come from? Sin. If I, have, if I have death and corruption, I must also have a sin. Does that make sense? Because death and corruption are rooted in sin. What does sin in my mother, in sin my mother conceive me mean? Oh, it means a couple things. <laughs> um, this is probably this is one of the kind of. My understanding, my simple, that this is very controversial topic as well. So that's my understanding. That because we understand about the death and corruption, but in sin, my mother conceived me again. It has to do with the interpretation. What does it? Mean? Sure. So if we're talking about procreation, procreation isn't wrong. The Barak, that's why people get married, right? And this is what God. Or no, God... I'm not going to procreation, of course. Not, not yeah, yeah. Right, so, so procreation itself, taban, it's, it's something that he said, be fruitful and multiply. Mishwarat, right? The Baraks, God created human beings that way. The problem is, is the, uh, the technical term is concupiscence. Yani it's the idea of the sensuality that's associated, the desire that's associated with. And they believe that the fathers, they say that this entered with the sin. No, I'm more confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, My understanding yeah. of the sin is the inclination for the sin. Right. So, so in sin, my mother conceived, meaning I, I have the inclination. I have an inclination towards the sin, yes. Towards sin. Yes. But I, uh, 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 I have received Adam's death and corruption, not his sin. They sin, don't. As sin as. The inclination. Right. So, so 
let me say two things about this. Because, because this, in, in, in say my mother conceived me, yeah, yeah, and it could carry many, yeah. Well, let me say let me two things about this. The first thing is that um, there's a difference between kind of the active sin and they can, the difference between kind of active and passive. When we think about this, this topic, it's simpler to say that whatever is Adam's has become mine because I came from him. So if in Adam is sin and death and corruption, I came from him, I have a sin, death, and corruption. The fathers are very clear that I didn't do what he did. Why? Because we weren't there. Right? Obviously. Right? But when he sinned, sin entered our nature. For madam, I came from him, but I have what he has. Is it inheritance? It's inheritance. Right? And the way that they describe it, one of the ways they describe it is like a debt. It's just a, it's a way to explain what happened. Say, say my parents, they incurred a debt. They did something, they have a debt, and they didn't pay it off. Who is the one who inherits that debt? Children. The, the closest relatives or whoever, right? Did they do anything? They didn't do anything, but they still have a, a debt. And along with that debt comes all of the penalties that are associated with the debt. And if I don't pay it off, even though I didn't incur the debt, if I don't pay it off, I'm going to receive all of the penalties that they would have received, right? When they didn't pay. It's the idea of the debt. And St. Paul, he writes it. No, it doesn't say St. Corinthians, Colossians, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that Christ, what he nailed to the cross was the... The handwriting that was written against us. You know, that, it was a legal document. It was a financial doc, That was the mind mentality. The Kurda are these analogies to help us to try and understand exactly what happened, to, you know, what, what we received. So, yes, so this is the first point. The second point is people, they tried to say, okay, we took the inclination, but we didn't take his sin. The way the fathers speak about it, they don't distinguish the two. They don't distinct in the way that they speak about it. The only difference between us and Adam, he did what he did. I didn't do it physically because we didn't exist at the time. But everything that is his has become mine, as if I did it. Yani with, yani with Adam's sin came penalty and a curse and punishment. When I am born, I'm under all of those things, Bardo. But the difference with us is we have uh, the salvation of Christ. So when the person believes in Christ, he is freed from all of those by grace. What we receive from the first Adam is by nature. What we receive from Christ is uh, by grace. I don't know if this helps, Abuna. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify that the, the, the sin, of course, not the procreation, but, but, but that's uh, uh, wait, wait, specifically. Yeah. And it's not the specific actions of, uh, of, of, of Adam, but it is the, the nature or the inclination course. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, so that because this becomes sometimes... Yeah. Uh, but it's not wrong to say that we received Adam's sin with this understanding. We don't don't think about it as something, Yani. Yes, I, I, I get it. I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I go to the liturgy, especially with the, the part like he was incarnate and became man, that he loved his own water in the world, and, and like he gave himself as a ransom, which is substitution, like that. Right. In, in instead of me, uh, as a ransom, on our behalf, gave himself up to unto death until the death which reigned over us, whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins. Yeah. Yeah. But before this, the section before this, when he says, who formed us and created us and placed us in the paradise, placed us in the paradise and joy. When we disobeyed your commandment, it's in the plural, it's all of us. When we disobeyed your commandment, as if, yani, what, what, what Adam did is related to, uh, to all of us. When we disobeyed your commandment, by the deceit of the serpent, 
we fell from eternal life and were exiled from the paradise of joy. Yani when Adam was cast out, we were all cast out eh, with him. So whatever is Adam's has become ours. If he is under sin, ehna we're under sin. Under curse, ehna we're under curse. And St. Paul, he talks about this in much more detail in Romans 5. In Romans 5. Through one man came, and, and, and through the, the, the second, yani, uh, and through Christ came. Yani, when he speaks about judgment and condemnation in Adam and righteousness in Christ, when he speaks about disobedience in Adam, through one, man, one man's disobedience, many became eh, sinners. But by the obedience of eh, in Romans 5, yani 19, 18, and 19, in this area. Yes? Sorry guys, you're both Before we go on, Marish, does this answer your question? So the idea of the denial of sinfulness in humanity, yani, oh, the, the, denial of, the denial of the sinfulness in humanity is a denial of the redemption of Christ. All right? Just keep it very simple. Yes, go ahead. It is short, okay, because it's 10.30, right now we finished that. Sure. But be careful, I told him my answers are never short. Otherwise, you take it uh, back. <laughs> okay, Mesh, all right. Like, now we inherited this from Adam. We're not living in the Old Testament, we're living in our race. And Khalas Adam, Allah, Hamu, he's in the ring. Right? So now, <laughs> 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 but you know, so now we're living in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> what do I supposed to say? He's dead. He's so the I'm sorry. I'm serious. So the Gwati means that Jesus came, he's the second Adam. We live in by the grace of God. So why do you still have to be inherited with that sin, even though Jesus came with us as a ransom, as you mentioned? Very good. It's, it's an excellent question. And I'll try to keep it simple. What Christ did, he did what Christ did, he did in himself on our behalf. Yes. But it doesn't just transfer to us immediately. Just stay with me for a moment, okay? So what happened to what what Christ, like I said, to what, in the in the in a moment ago, what we receive in Adam is by nature, but what we receive from Christ is by grace. What Christ did for us, He did in Himself on our behalf. But for me, but but for me to be saved. What he did must be transferred to me. We read this on the Feast of Pentecost. I don't know if you paid attention to it or not. The gospel that was read in the Feast of Pentecost in John 16. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and eh, declare it to you. So he's going to take of what is mine and declare it to you. This is the importance of the church. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church transfers to us the saving effect of Christ to us. So Christ, I'll give you an example. Christ, he died for us and he rose from the dead. Mishkeda? For me to live with him or to receive the, or to be with him, I have to die with him and be risen with him. Mishkeda? When does this happen? In baptism. How does the baptism work? It's through the work of the Holy Spirit, right? And the baptismal font. And for my sake, Mishkeda? So the Holy Spirit in the church transfers all the saving of effect of Christ to, uh, to us. Yes. Clear? Mm -hmm. So what he did, he did for us on our behalf. But I have to enter into this life. It has to be transferred to me. So I, I die with Christ and I'm risen with him. That I have to be united with him. How am I united with him? I have to receive the Holy Spirit in confirmation. We'll become a branch that becomes attached to it. Uh, the true vine, the tree, Mishkada. And that way I can I have life with him. This is how I become a part of the church, a member of his body. I have to partake of the Eucharist. He says, if we don't partake of his flesh and blood, we have a, no life in you. Yeah? Clear? Okay. That was the quick answer. Okay. <laughs> It, it, it's nice that I like the interaction, so yeah. we, we want to 
probably we need to. Uh, this is what happened, by the way, in the morning with the father, <laughs> and we agreed to have uh, a deacon brother Antonius like uh, for a retreat time, not just no, 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 uh, an event. Sure <laughs> Again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much because this is not just knowledge, but this is our faith, this is our life, this is what we live uh, in, the, in, in the church. Uh, do we have any announcements? Just save the date for 